Hey, 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 geeks and geekettes, it's Chuck Dixon back for another edition of, oddly enough, Ask Chuck Dixon, where you get to ask me, a 30-year-plus veteran in the comic book industry, any question you like, and I will do my very, very, very best to answer it. So uh, let's go there. We'll start out with Big B. Ed Robinson was kind enough to send in a picture of his canine companion, and let's all say it together. What a good boy. Alec Jensen, do you prefer Ditko or Ramita Senior Art for Spider-Man? I'm a Ditko guy. I've been a Ditko guy from before he was doing Spider-Man. Uh, when I used to, he used to do those backup stories and strange tales. Well, not even backup. The entire book was an anthology title uh, of, uh, you know, mysterious and weird tales because they couldn't do horror comics back then. Couldn't even put the word horror on the cover of a comic book. But uh, I was a big devotee of his stuff. Um, I even learned his name because he would surreptitiously sign his work. He was one of the few Marvel artists that uh, that was allowed to slip through. And they, in, in Amazing Adult Fantasy, they even mentioned his name in ads along with Stan Lee. So he's really the first artist that I took notice of and I got so deeply into Spider-Man. Uh, those first few years of Spider-Man under Ditko's Aegis are just the template for how to do a compelling superhero story. Um, just terrific stuff. Plenty of heart and edge. And Ditko poured his heart into this title, and, and it's obvious. And I'll talk a little bit of, more about that down the road. But, uh, you know, in just a few seconds, actually. But, you know, I, I just... You know, identify with Peter Parker like so many of us have. Uh, it was a different kind of character because he was more three-dimensional, more rounded uh, than your standard superhero character. It wasn't all about action. It was about the continuing prevails of Peter Parker's life. And um, that's what I mean about that Ditko put himself into this book and uh, into the creation of this character. Uh, Dean Mullaney... Uh, had prepared a tremendous in-depth biography of Ditko that unfortunately got lost in a flood, literally. <laughs> all, the, all the work and galleys and proofs and just, just vanished. And this is the pre-digital age, so there was no copies. And to, to recreate that book would have been a her Herculean task. So it was kind of tedious. Nobody wants to rewrite a book they've already written. But in, in the book, uh, uh, Dean visited his family in Jonesboro. Uh, you know, not Jonesboro, um, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Nobody wants to go to Jonesboro. Uh, so, uh, the problem was everybody wanted to go to Jonesboro. They just never came home. Uh, so anyway, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, I'm being silly. Uh, and he visited with Ditko's family, and they showed him um, Steve Ditko's high school yearbook. And in there was this picture that uh, of, 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 of a young Steve Ditko, in his glasses and his sweater vest and his tie in, uh, in a lab holding up test tubes. <laughs> and standing behind him was this big, blonde, beefy guy in a varsity sweater. I mean, it was Peter and Flash. And, uh, you know, Dean said he just got this chill up his spine when he saw this picture. And I got my chill up, chill up my spine when he was telling me about it. So, um, you know, proof positive that Ditko poured himself into this book, uh, into this superhero, and Peter Parker is somewhat autobiographical for uh, Steve Ditko. And when I was a kid, I got that somehow. I got that Steve Ditko was pouring himself into Spider-Man the same way that I, that I knew Charles Schultz was pouring himself into Peanuts, that these were very personal creations for Steve Ditko, um, you know, in a weird way. It's a superhero title. Uh, but, but why did he do that? Well, he just drew on his own life and really invested himself in this series, and he felt he owned it. Now, Stanley wrote the dialogue and everything else, but the plotting, creation, characters, it was all Ditko. Um, in those days, Stan was writing so many books, he didn't have time for things like plotting <laughs> and character creation. And a lot of this was left up to uh, Steve Steve Ditko and Jack Kirby to create these iconic characters that we know. But when I was a kid, I, I just had a feeling, you know, you're a kid, you don't know how to put things in the words, words, but 
I was intuiting that this is something meaningful to this creator, my man Steve Ditko. I also somehow understood that this was Ditko's work, not Lee's. Now, how I knew that, I don't know. Maybe because it was so unique uh, and so different from anything I had seen Stan Lee write on his own. Uh, I felt so strongly about this that when Ditko left, and there was no reason given for Ditko leaving, uh, I wasn't into any kind of fandom. There really wasn't much fandom. You couldn't find out behind the scenes stuff on a comic book. Uh, I mean, the most we ever got was Stan Lee informing us of what was going on at Marvel. And of course, that's from his point of view. But I knew, I knew in my, you know, little 11 year old heart <laughs> that Steve Ditko did not want to leave Spider-Man. And that, that there was dirty work at the crossroads. There was some reason that my man, my favorite artist, had to leave his signature creation, as well as Doctor Strange. And why? Uh, I just had the sense that, that my man got screwed. And of course, all of that was confirmed in later life, uh, as we find out more and more of the story, that Ditko was unhappy with, the, 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 with Lee dictating things to him, taking over a book that he really had no, uh, didn't have a large part in creating. Uh, and not allowing Ditko to drive the book the way he wanted. And I got to agree with Steve Ditko because a lot of the ideas Stan had, I, I didn't like. And of course, Stan went on to continue writing the book. That brings us to Johnny Romita Sr. Johnny Romita Sr., literally one of the nicest guys you'd ever want to meet. I mean, just a gentleman, just a terrific dude and a super pro and everything else. And I don't want to diss John Romita Sr., but... Um, his work was not the same as Ditko's. And, and, and part of the reason, of course, is because Ditko was no longer there, the driving force behind this book, it was left up to Stan Lee to create characters, situations, and uh, plot lines. And uh, he wasn't as invested in the character as Steve Ditko had been. So no fault of Johnny Romita Sr., who's a fantastic artist, undeniably cre created a lot of his own very very iconic spider-man imagery never going to take that away from him uh, but the for me i the book lacked uh direction uh it lacked the zest it lacked the surprises that it had under the ditko run and also stan morphs peter parker away from steve ditko's image of peter parker as the the lovable loser the guy who just can't get a break. You know, the nerdy guy that everybody's going to put down when he has this awesome secret. He's Spider-Man. He can't tell anybody because of Aunt May and because of the repercussions on his private life. And that was really what this book was about. You know, that was the background tension, the suspense that ran through this title, uh, you know, under, under Ditko. Under Stan Lee, Peter becomes cooler. You know, he loses the glasses. He's dressing hipper. Uh, well, as hip as, you know, a couple of guys <laughs> in their 30s and 40s could make him. And, and he starts talking hipper, but in a Stan Lee kind of way. You know, he's, his, his dialogue becomes cute and clever as opposed to funny and self-effacing. And, and suddenly he's talking in a contemporary way, as, at least as far as Stan Lee was concerned. Uh, even as um, a teenager reading these books, and these, in this, this language Lee was, supposed to, was using was supposed to appeal to me. Like I was supposed to go, hey, he talks just like me. No, he talked like a Las Vegas lounge lizard. You know, <laughs> the weird wordplay. And uh, everybody in the book kind of talked that way. And, uh, all, you know, it taught me one lesson that if I ever wrote about a teenage hero, and I eventually write, wrote about a few, uh, don't do that. Don't try to include contemporary slang, contemporary language, because all you're doing is dating the character. And also, uh, by the time I hear the latest cool phrase, it's not cool anymore. <laughs> uh, if I have to go around asking, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? You know, it's like, no, just have the characters talk like normal people because not everybody talks in slang 24-7. But anyway, yeah, I made it pretty clear, Ditko rules. Uh, but Ramita Sr., I'm not going to take anything away from the guy. Uh, awesome talent, 
but the book did suffer when uh, Mr. Ditko departed. Michael Hutchinson, Chuck, when you took the reins of Black Canary and created Birds of Prey, with Jordan Gorfinkel, of course, you changed Black Canary's look. She was back to sporting a classic fish, fishnets and bustier with jacket look. She had reverted to that after the 1980s Olivia Newton-John in a turtleneck sweat, sweatsuit look. You gave her a new look, short dyed blonde hair and a one piece that was tactical except for the bare legs. Was it your choice to redesign her or were you asked to do it? And what goes into making that happen when it's an iconic and marketable character? Is there some sort of review or guidance from the higher ups? We're talking about DC Comics in the 1990s, not today, where I couldn't tell you what anybody's fixed look is anymore. Um, yeah, I wasn't really privy to any of the costume changing. I, I think they wanted to get her away from the fishnet stocking look. And as you can see here, we, you know, our artists uh, varied the costume up a bit. You know, kept the color scheme basically the same, but, you know, varied it up quite a bit. But I think the reason, the main reason we left the fishnets behind is because um, Bert, Black Canary had just been featured in her own solo book that failed. And she was in the traditional, uh, you know, waistcoat, whatever that short jacket is. And uh, I don't know where that look comes from. Maybe somebody can tell me, what, what is that look? Uh, it, it, you know, almost like an abbreviated, I don't know what it was. <laughs> anyway, we got rid of that look because we didn't want readers immediately associating this new book with... Um, a title that had just failed. And I think that was the reasoning behind it. But I really wasn't in on it. I mean, um, the first time Gary Frank drew her, she was in a different outfit. And I thought, well, this is the outfit she's in. doesn't really alter what I'm writing. Um, and then, you know, we continued on from there. And as I say, you know, she um, she varied the costume as, as needed in the stories, uh, depending on what was going on in the stories. And... Um, you know, it was really pretty much up to the artist as long as they remain to the same color scheme. It's like I've talked about Badger recently. As long as Badger has something red on and the Badger logo and his red mask, uh, we always know it's the Badger no matter what he's dressed in. Punisher as well. So we sort of took that approach. She had like a full battle dress and then her more casual, I don't know what you'd call it, onesie, uh, onesie look with legs exposed. So that's really all I know about it. I wish I could tell you more. I'm sure there were meetings, many, many meetings. <laughs> JDC, I was rereading your wonderful The Death of Joe Hallen storyline from your run on Marvel Comics The Nom. This series was designed to portray the war realistically versus Marvel's traditional superheroes and camo war portrayal in Sergeant Fury, Combat Kelly, etc. How do you get this? How did you get this assignment? And is your writing realistic approach different with this type of realistic portrayal as your stories for Team 7, Sergeant Rock, etc.? Um, well, I was brought on the title when the editors became unhappy with the original writer, Doug Murray. Uh, they felt, uh, I don't know what they felt. I don't, I don't really, I wasn't real clear on their reasonings for letting Doug go. But what Doug had going for him in a big way was uh, he was a Vietnam vet. He had been in Vietnam. So he's very conversant with this stuff. And yes, he had to do research, but you know, he had this base knowledge of the attitudes and most importantly, the language, how these guys talked. So he brought that original verisimilitude to the book. There's a big word. Uh, and I pronounced it right the first time. It usually takes me six times to say that word. Uh, anyway, he, he brought that believability, that immediacy, that authority to writing the novel. And when they let him go, they needed another writer. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of Vietnam vet comic book writers, you know, hanging around the Marvel offices. So Don Daly asked me to take over the title. And I said, I don't feel good about that because the marketing for this book initially was, it's written by a guy who was there. And I wasn't there. Uh, and Don said, well, I really want you on it. And there's really nobody else here. There's nobody in my stable that could take this on. And I said, yeah, I really don't feel good about it. And he said, look, do, do me a favor. Talk to Larry Hama. Because Larry Hama was a Vietnam vet. He says, you trust his opinion. Ask him what he thinks about you taking over this book. So I called Larry. 
And Larry told me, he said, look, you're going to do the homework. And he says, I know, I know who you are, and I know you'll approach this book with very seriously. And um, he says, I feel fine about it. He says, as a guy who served over there, he says, I, I feel it's in good hands if you write it. And he goes, but um, talk to Wayne Van Zandt, who was the artist in the book at the time, also a Vietnam vet, and have him hook you up with actual, actual vets. So if you have questions, you have a bunch of guys you can ask. And that's when I said yes. Uh, because, you know, it's a war book. I like writing in the genre. And also, it would be an opportunity to, to talk to a whole bunch of Vietnam vets. And I, I always enjoy that. Uh, sometimes it's not a roller coaster fun ride, you know, with cotton candy. Sometimes it's difficult conversations. But I like reaching out to these guys, you know, vets from any conflict, and, and speaking to them and, and hearing what they have to say. Because it's, you know, I'm getting schooled. And uh, so, you know, so my approach to the book obviously was as realistic as I could make it. The death of Joe Hallen is about a, a uh, African-American guy who, who volunteers to go to Vietnam. And uh, he's from Baltimore. And there's a conflict because he gets no respect at home for wearing the uniform. Uh, and, you know, he has some horrible things happen to him while in country. And all of these conflicts and how he deals with them. And in some cases deals with them very poorly. But... Um, I wanted to do that because, uh, you know, I worked in Philadelphia blue collar jobs, you know, stock boy, janitor, and stuff like that. And I met a lot of African American Vietnam vets and, you know, heard their stories. And I, I wanted to use a lot of that material uh, in the NAM in my initial arc. And then I, I, then I went on to create my own recurring characters and, and things like that. Uh, but I enjoyed my time on the book, and as Larry said, I, I would do the homework. I, I read so much about Vietnam, I, I, I lost count of how many books I read, and all of the visual reference I gathered that I could share with the artist. But usually it was you know, Wayne Van Zandt on the book. He had probably a bigger photo morgue than I did. But I also got to work with you know, Russ Heath and, and a few other artists. And... Um, yeah, I dug my time on it. It was it was good. It was it was it was it was a fun ride, and uh, you know I I still value those conversations I had with vets. Uh, some of them funny, some of them grim. Speaking of Vietnam, speaking of talking to vets, I'm currently working on a Vietnam era project. Actually, my writing is done. The art's being completed. I can't tell you any more about it because it hasn't been announced yet. But uh, it took me right back to writing the Nam. And it also allowed me, uh, this project, which is a graphic novel, it will be in color, um, it allowed me to use a whole bunch of vet stories that I couldn't use in the NOM due to um, comics code <laughs> restrictions. And these are stories I always wanted to tell. And uh, this one, almost everything that happens in this book was something told to me by a uh, Vietnam vet who was in country at the time uh, this story takes place. So uh, look out for that. Probably be announced maybe in another month or so. And uh, thanks for the question. Jeffrey King. Mr. Dixon, would you mind giving us more details about your unpublished World War II related birds of prey? Well, here we are back to another war story. Uh, yeah, I... Every year at DC, they, they needed, if you were the regular writer on a book, something that doesn't happen anymore, who, what's a regular writer? If you were the regular writer on the book and you had a continuity contract, continuity contract guaranteed that you would write 12 issues a year, you wouldn't need fill-ins, and at the end of the year, you got a bonus. But it actually included 13 issues because they always wanted you to write an inventory issue, something that could be drawn, that was standalone, could be put in anywhere in the run, and... Uh, didn't have to be by the regular artist. And, uh, you know, you, you get paid for it. So you did 13 issues, and then they gave you a bonus at the end of the year. And it was, terrific. Great system. So there was always something in the drawer in case they ran into deadline problems with an artist. Well, one of these was a story I called Birds of Prey, 1943. And initially it was going to be drawn by Butch Geis, 
scheduling problems did not allow for him to draw it. And, and I said, well, I need a guy who can make this look like a comic strip from 1943, set in World War II. Yes, Elseworld story. And the gimmick of this book was, is that you were going to read it sideways. You had to turn the book sideways. And we actually presented six weeks of an imaginary Birds of Prey comic strip, dailies and Sundays. The dailies would be presented in black and white with a, a kind of a, a yellow, pale yellow feel behind it. It looked like they had been clipped from an old newspaper. And the, and the Sundays, of course, would be in full color. And uh, it tells like part of an arc. It's not like a complete story. We sort of join the, the birds mid-action and then, you know, we kind of end on a little cliffhanger at the end. Yeah, yeah, lots of Nazis get shot out of the sky. And, and that's what it is. It's an aviation strip. Um, and uh, boy, I had fun writing it. And then, of course, it, you know, they, they pitched a couple of artists to me, and I said, no, those guys cannot mimic the style I need. It has to really look like it's from the 1940s. And, of course, my first choice was Lito Fernandez. He's an Argentine artist, and he has that Kniff, Null Sickles, Frank Robbins feel to his artwork, and I knew he would do the homework. I know he's got a huge, he's a big fan of the old aviation strips, like, you know, Steve Canyon and Johnny Hazard and stuff like that. And he would do it up right, and he did. Uh, and uh, I worked with him before on a book called Invasion 55. Uh, and then after this project, many years after this project, he and I did an Airboy project together as well, which you should check out. <laughs> it's uh, Airboy 1942. Uh, you know, set in the World War II era. But uh, as you can see, just a simply, simply gorgeous work. Now, if you haven't, no, that was never published. And several freelancers pressured the Birds of Prey editor at the time to like, put it in a special. You know, if you do a hundred page giant, put it in. And they, there was resistance and they never did. So as far as I know, uh, Lido got his originals back and it, it languishes, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, the film of it languishes somewhere in the DC files, but uh, it's a shame it never got published because you know obviously I would have thought that was cool, and I think readers would have dug it. Uh, now, if you want to see all the artwork and some of the script, for some reason I only have up to page 15 of the script. You can go to Subscribestar. I'll put the link below the video here. You can go to Subscribestar.com, Chuck Dixon, and if you join up. We have a $5 tier, I have a $1 tier, and uh, $5 tier, you'll get physical goodies every once in a while, signed comics and, and special products and little sketches and stuff like that that I've done. And, and you'll get physical stuff at the $5 tier. At the $1 tier, you only get the digital goodies, which you also get with the $5 tier. A new digital goodie every month. And, and one of the first digital goodies I put up was the master file for Birds of Prey 1943 with uh, high-res uh, copies of all of the artwork and, as I said, most of the script. So you, you can check it out for yourself if you go to Subscribestar and uh, hand in your ride ticket. You'll, you'll see when you get there. <laughs> Kevin Cruz. Recently, I saw a video by Razorfist about the importance of the Western, and he mentioned your video about it. He made a call for creatives to develop new Westerns. But my question is, is the Western as an American genre only considered as such if the setting is in the United States? I am Dominican and would like to create a story taking elements of the Western taking place in my country between the 1800s and 1850s. As for me, I will do it anyway because I'm a writer and no one can stop me. Good for you. But I would like to hear your opinions and your advice about Westerns outside of the USA. P.S. is the Bruno Bookstore because Bruce Wayne in Spanish is Bruno Diaz. Okay, um, the Western is, this is what a Western is. It is a group of conflicts between people or nature or groups of people that by the end of the story is resolved through violence. You can set a Western anywhere. There's a, there's a, a, a film, uh, a, a Chinese film or a Hong Kong film. I believe it's Hong Kong. It might have been Korean. Um, the Good, the Bad, and the Weird. And it's a Western. 
undeniably hell of a western. And uh, but it, you know it's set in uh, I think Manchuria, so you know you can take the western anywhere, and the western has been taken anywhere. The Sam Peckinpah, you know, you know, cut his teeth on westerns. He did western TV series. He did Ride the High Country, The Wild Bunch, and a bunch of westerns after that. Uh, in the early '70s, when when a studio optioned the story of Frank Serpico, the cop who fought corruption. They were going to make it, it's unbelievable, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but it's true. They were going to make it a, uh, they were going to team Robert Redford and Paul Newman together, you know, because they had been so successful in two other films. They are going to team them together for the story of Frank Serpico, and Redford was going to play Serpico. <laughs> yeah, I know, it makes no sense. Um, and Paul Newman was going to take the place that ultimately Tony Roberts played in the Al Pacino film. And they brought in Peckinpah for some weird reason. And they said, would you, want I guess just to make it weirder. And they asked Peckinpah, you know, uh, what do you need? You know, what do you need as far as story? And he said, write me a Western. And they said, no, 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 this takes place in 1960s New York City. And he says, hey, the story's a Western. It's one guy standing up against the system and it, you know, resolves itself in violence at the end. So that's how adaptable a, uh, a Western can be. And you know, we see Westerns all the time on TV. They're just not riding horses and, and cowboy hats. You know, TV and movies use the Western genre plot lines constantly. Uh, much of Star Wars is, is Western inspired. You know, almost any franchise or, or film thing you can look at is somehow um, adaptable. Westerns are adaptable. The samurai film, you know, so many samurai films were inspired by the work of Howard Hawks, John Ford, Anthony Mann, and other, you know, Western genre directors. And, you know, it went both ways because The Magnificent Seven is based off a Kurosawa film. Uh, uh, Fistful of Dollars is based off a, of, of a Kurosawa film. And, and if you see, you know, Magnificent Seven and Seven Samurai or Yojimbo and Fistful of Dollars back to back, you see that there's no change in the story. Nothing's been changed. They are direct adaptations because a, a Shambara uh, genre story is exactly the same as a Western. A bunch of conflicts are created between people, except that, of course, in Japan, they're more nuanced and mannered conflicts, but still, it all is resolved or ends in violence, the same as a Western does. You know, nobody's getting to the end of a samurai story and talking it out. <laughs> you know, it's it's going to be blood on the wall. So the two genres are perfect. So, yeah, you set your Western wherever the hell you want to set it. Now, this is the question of Bruno Books. Bruno Books is named after my cat, uh, who's no longer with us, Bruno. And he's a Tonkinese, and Bruno is the only name that would have suited this cat. Uh, and I, you know, used a photograph of his and uh, my good friend Eric Burnham, created the Bruno Books logo based off the photograph because uh, Bruno was my often my uh, office mate, sort of hanging out with me when I wrote all day. And I thought, Bruno Books has a great sound to it. It's alliterative, and the cat logo is just a little bit mysterious. So there you go, the secret of Bruno Books. John's Long Box, I am a big fan. Every time I watch your videos, I spend at least 20 bucks. Yes! <laughs> It's the, it's the whole point of these. No, it's not the whole point. I like talking to you people. But, you know, hey, I'm a professional writer. You know, I'm always hawking my wares. Um, okay. I bought Shrinkage, Brath, The Forgotten Man, Flashman of the Charge. Which I, I don't get anything from that. I didn't write it. And so many others of your works or recommendations. My question is, if Brath ended on a cliffhanger at issue 14, did issue 15 ever come out? And if not, are there any plans for the story to finish? Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for, you know, because, you know, I appreciate that, you know, <laughs> uh, these videos inspire you to go shopping. I do the same thing. If I go to, like, um, a Facebook page about vintage paperbacks or something like that, it's like, dang, I didn't know about this one. I'm going to have to buy that. <laughs> end up spending a bunch of money. There's a couple of guys who post on Facebook that cost me money every time I read their posts. But Brath, Brath, um, 
was the title I did a cross gen. It was set in a, you know, like everything, a cross gen set in an alternate universe that I ignored the alternate universe aspect and just wrote about Rome, uh, the Roman Empire in Britain and all of the trials and travails. Brath is kind of uh, an asterisk that gets really mean. <laughs> so, it had all the sword and sandal stuff I loved as a kid and uh, some Conan aspects, of course. The, 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 the comparisons are inevitable. Um, now, issue 15 was completed, and I do have, I, I have all the originals for that issue. I don't know if I have the script. I'll have to look. Um, I might make that one a digital goodie on Subscribestar. You've just inspired me. But yeah, we were, you know, I was heading toward like a issue 24 conclusion to the whole thing. Um, I didn't see this as an ongoing. Uh, maybe they'd bring on another writer and they could keep it going. But, but, but I had plans up to issue 24 that would, you know, generally wrap everything up. And, and, not, and, and not to have a spoiler, but why not spoil it? You're never going to be able to read it. <laughs> it would, would have ended with Brath seated upon Caesar's throne. So, totally unhistoric. Uh, but we were dealing with an alternate universe. So, anything went. And I want to thank you for picking up Shrinkage. I'd love to hear what you thought of it. Uh, Shrinkage is a book that, of mine, doesn't get a lot of attention. A little different for me. It's a story about a shoplifter. It's set in uh, Philadelphia in the 1970s. And people tell me it's the best thing I've ever written. Uh, I don't know. I'm no judge. Uh, I certainly enjoyed writing it. And it's probably the fastest uh, turnaround I ever did on a novel. I think I had this thing completely written in three weeks because it just sort of poured out of me for some reason. I really got into the characters and situations. And it was my attempt to write a, a gold medal paperback from, from the 50s and 60s. You know, that kind of storyline. All right. Victor von der Rupp Brenner. And man, I, that's your real name. That is cool. I recently binged my way through the incredible Nightwing ongoing you pioneered. Of course, I came to love the series and the character of Dick Grayson even more. I came to the question, how do you react to news that Bloodhaven was vaporized by metal men Nemesis Chemo, or Chemo, I, I never knew how to pronounce that, during Infinite Crisis and was destroyed till the next reboot of the whole DC universe? Well, one is never happy to see one's creations destroyed, but you realize, hey, Things move on. Comics are one big, long saga. Superhero comics, anyway. Just this endless 80-year-long um, continuing soap opera. Uh, but I did take it kind of personal because they killed every single one of my Nightwing villains that I created. And I created, I created a whole brand new rogues gallery for Nightwing. And they killed them all except Lady Vic. I think they forgot Lady Vic. Somehow... You know, she's a, she's a slippery dame. She, she somehow eluded their attempts to uh, eliminate her. And, and as far as I know, still exists in continuity today. But they killed off my rogues gallery, but they weren't happy with that. <laughs> they wanted to make sure they didn't miss anything. So they, they had chemo basically destroy the place, you know, in like a, you know, hyperbaric explosion that just killed everybody and knocked all the buildings down and just turned Bloodhaven into a smoking crater. I guess they didn't realize Lady Vic wasn't a local. Maybe that's how she escaped. <laughs> but just to make sure that everybody I created had died, they nuked the place. It's hard not to take that personally. Uh, now, now, if they had, you know, not been killing off all of my creations prior to that, I, I wouldn't be so bummed uh, because I think, well, they just you know, came up with this crazy story. But it seems so methodical. <laughs> oh, man. So there you go. I try not to take things personally because if I do, they've won. You know what I mean? Okay, sequential treasures. I got a couple of questions for you, Chuck. In your experience, do you think that comic book writers and artists who self-insert themselves into their characters and stories are merely lacking in creativity, or are they simply narcissists with an agenda beyond just entertaining the audience? The answer could be both. Uh, or is it a bit of both? It, yes, it is. Boy, I'm not reading ahead. Uh, and <laughs> do you think that such attitudes have ruined comic book storytelling in our current times? I think narcissism has ruined comic book storytelling. 
uh, mostly narcissism amongst the editors that anybody gives a crap what they think about the world, uh, you know, what they think on political issues or cultural issues or whatever, which all should remain outside the purview of comic book creations. Um, but, um, you know, that said, uh, I'm going to follow this up with W.T. Keaton, this kind of related question. Chuck, have you ever written yourself into a comic story? Only once, well, at least intentionally. I, I guess writers put themselves in stories even when they don't mean to or don't know that they're doing it. But the only time I intentionally wrote myself into a story was um, an issue of Law Dog, Law Dog number eight. Uh, Flint Henry was running into deadline problems, and so we did you know, a fill-in issue, and it was a series of stories, um, short stories, one written by Gary Quappas, or not written, written, they're all written by me, uh, one drawn by Gary Quappas, one drawn by Enrique Villagran, and one drawn by uh, Ralph Snark creator Mark Hansen. And, but, we, but we wanted to have a bridge, we wanted to have an explanation of what these stories were, and so Flint drew a bridging sequence featuring himself and me, which I wrote, and it was basically one of our um, creative jam sessions, always held at Flint's apartment, uh, his apartment where he had his studio. And it's kind of represents a quarter. It, it's kind of like those backups they used to have in the Marvel annuals where they would show Stan and Jack, you know, uh, fighting over the storyline. And, and that's what we took it from. And this is kind of an exaggerated uh, example, exaggerated yet uh, at its heart accurate uh, <laughs> portrayal of, of uh, the, the Flint and I and our, our, our creative relationship. H.W. <laughs> uh, Taylor asks, Chuck, if you were to suggest a single arc of yours that an inspiring writer wanted to study in order to learn how to tell stories over a series of issues, which run would you suggest? Well, uh, whoa, how did that get in there? That's the, in the wrong place. Anyway, that's more Flint and me. <laughs> Flint's such a nut. Uh, okay, the infamous Captain Fear. Uh, storyline I would point to you're probably sick of hearing about this storyline but it's to me it was the most perfect two story two issue arc I'd ever worked on while working on the Batman titles and Graham Nolan agrees with me and the editors didn't but that said um, it I, th I think it's the perfect superhero arc because it introduces a new villain introduces, introduces his motivation what his big crime is going to be. Uh, Batman working as a detective has all those elements in it. Uh, Batman working with his team, both Robin and Nightwing appear in, in this arc. And, and ends, it climaxes with a trap, which I've said over and over again, uh, is traps are hard to come up with. Convincing trap and the escape from, the, from said trap are hard to come up with, for me anyway. And Graham and I were dedicated to the idea of, we, we did a number of traps over our run on Detective Comics, but we were dedicated to doing what we felt was our ultimate uh, Batman inescapable trap. And for me, you know, for me and Graham, we were proud of this two issue arc because for us it had everything a Batman story should have. It had every element that a classic Batman story should have wrapped up into a tidy 44 pages. Of, of story and art and uh, boy we you know couldn't have been more wrong <laughs> when it got to uh, the editors so anyway I've had a lot of questions a lot of messages a lot of DMs and emails about the last video or, or maybe it was two videos ago where I talked about my original art that I had received from artists over time and people wanted to see some of it so here we go. Uh, this was the uh, Alcatena, Kike Alcatena cover. These these hang in my office, by the way. I can I'm, I can turn my head and look at each one of these right now, um, and uh, um, right next to my collection of loaded shotguns, by the way, uh, in my gated community uh, with lots of cameras. Anyway, <laughs> just as an aside, just as a point of interest to anybody. Uh, who feel that these uh, pieces of artwork should not have the ignominy of being in my collection. 
anyway, so this is the cover of Detective Annual number seven, originally done as a pitch piece, and then uh, we we just used it as a cover by Kiki Alcatena, uh, Captain Leatherwing. Uh, this I can look look up above my monitor and see it's a signed silk screen by Jack Kirby. Uh, well, he didn't do the silk screening; he just signed it. But it's one of my treasure pieces. I do have the matching Fantastic Four piece, but it's in another room. So uh, this is uh, my second favorite Batman cover of all time. It's Graham Nolan gifted to me. It's from an issue of Detective Comics. It's from the middle of our Riddler run. Uh, my favorite the Batman cover, Graham will never let go of. Because <laughs> I think it's everybody's favorite in his run. Uh, Michael Golden cover, uh, which I bought from someone at CrossGen had it in their collection. And they needed money to buy more Michael Golden art, so I bought this off them. Uh, and I wanted it, you know, not only because it's a terrific cover, uh, and it uh, um, is by Michael Golden, but also it, it features two characters I created, Lynn Michaels and Payback, uh, you know, ancillary Punisher characters that I created. Uh, this is Rodolfo DiMaggio, inked by Bill Sienkiewicz. The results are staggering. It's from an issue of GCPD. And I can just turn my head to the left here and see that one hanging right there. Uh, this one I did work on. Uh, it's a Russ Heath from Star Spangled War. I love the Western theme of it. It's an oversized, back when they drew the two-up uh, original artwork, the real big pages. And it's, uh, Russ Heath probably forms the bulk of my uh, comic book. Uh, original art collection, and this is one of the pieces I prize. Uh, right above my, uh, <laughs> right above my monitor is this enormous Rio Bravo poster. It's a French poster. They're huge. They're like you know six foot by four foot, uh, and it's by the artist Mashi. And I, I love his stuff. Uh, he did so many iconic European posters. Occasionally, they would use them here in the United States as well. Uh, this is an Airboy piece I've spoken of in other videos uh, by Ernie Cologne. This was given to me because Ernie was, he knew we were all mad at him for blowing deadlines on the title, and he, he, he bought me off <laughs> with, the, with, with, with this beautiful uh, inked and, and Dr. Martin Dye's uh, full color cover painting. Uh, he bought off Bo Smith with another cover, which I, which I think I bought off of Bo. I'm not sure. Uh, so, and Cat Ironwood was angry at both of us because we, we allowed we, we allowed Ernie to basically corrupt us. Uh, this is not an original, but I had to frame it. It's a print sent to me by Rodolfo DiMaggio of a pitch piece that he did trying to get on one of the Indiana Jones sequels as a production artist. And storyboard guy and of course if you know anything about Rodolfo you should visit his website Rodolfo is like um, the king of production art out there he does amazing amazing st any of his storyboards could simply have word balloons slapped onto them and be made into graphic novels instantly he does amazing work if you go to Rodolfo if you search out Rodolfo DiMaggio uh, on the old web here you'll see some just jaw-dropping concept art and production art the guy was Guy's a genius. Um, and then this is the Blue Beetle piece that I've discussed in a previous video. It's the only um, original I own that I wrote the page one, knowing that I would want the original. <laughs> so I basically wrote myself a fabulous Butch Geis uh, pinup page with Blue Beetle on it. So I, I wrote myself a splash and then and then, you know, I offered to buy it from Butch. I always offered to buy. I never wanted to, but you know, he gave it to me because Butch is awesome. And uh, I think that's about it on that original artwork. Now let's get to what you're reading. What you're reading, Chuck. What are you looking at? What are you wasting your time with now? Uh, I, I, I picked up this collection of Trots and Bonnie, which if you're not familiar with, uh, ran for a long time in the National Lampoon. I've always been enamored with it. Always thought it was a really cool strip. And it, um, it's by Sherry Flanagan, and it, you know, it's, it's about a, a adolescent girl going through puberty, all that stuff. But the strip was often shocking in the way it would deal with material. Um, 
her friend Pepsi, who was, <laughs> Pepsi's a fascinating comical character because she changed with the time. She was always consistent, but whatever the going fad was, either politically or socially or culturally, Pepsi went with it if it suited her purposes. And uh, she's the bad girl of the strip. She's a terrible influence on Bonnie, <laughs> who's this innocent naif. And uh, th there's a recurring thing where uh, Pepsi either experiments or, or openly murders uh, one of the neighborhood kids over and over and over again. It's, it's like uh, Kenny on South Park. We see him castrated, drowned, <laughs> asphyxiated, shot, blown in half with a shotgun. But he's always back. He's always back in the next episode if, if, if Ms. Flanagan needed him. Now, her background was in underground comics. Uh, she worked with the Air Pirates, a rebellious group of underground artists who, for some reason, decided they wanted their asses sued off by Disney. So they were constantly tweaking Disney, poking Disney in the nose, uh, kicking Disney in the ass in their little publications and, and violating copyrights uh, willy-nilly until finally they were sued out of existence. I never quite understood what they were so mad at Disney about, uh, but they did. But the, but the, the end result was is that Sherry Flanagan, when she worked with them, uh, adopted this more antiquated comic strip style. Uh, if you look at uh, Bonnie and Trots and Bonnie. She's got little orphan Annie eyes. They're blank. And uh, so so she adopted, I, I don't know what she, you know, maybe she would have gone in that direction anyway. Maybe that's why they wanted her in their comics because uh, the Air Pirates are all about drawing in that antiquated comic strip style, either Disney or, or, or other, you know, George McManus or Harold, Harold Gray or those kind of things, uh, sort of having fun with that look. And that's the look she adopted for the strip. Now, she moved from the undergrounds to National Lampoon. Uh, if you aren't familiar with National Lampoon beyond it appearing uh, above movie titles, it was a long-running parody magazine. It was like mad for grown-ups. And it was often outrageous and, uh, you know, uh, anarchic. And, and it was never, never, it was fair politically. They mocked everybody. Uh, conservatives and liberals worked on the magazine. And uh, Trots and Bonnie was a perfect fit because it dealt with current social issues uh, in sometimes a very brutally frank way. Uh, and the strip, as I said, the strip was often shocking in the way <laughs> it dealt with material. And true to the National Lampoon's form, it, anybody was open for mockery, from, from conservatives to liberals to far left to hippies to, to whoever. Um, Sherry Flanagan herself is a dedicated feminist uh, you know, she, she, you know, she is of the left and, and proud of it. And that's great. But, but she did this in a day when the left had a sense of humor and wasn't afraid to make fun of itself. And so people on the left and, and trends on the left often come up as objects of mockery in Trots and Bonnie. And that's one of the things that makes it kind of timeless. It's, you know, I laugh just as much reading this collection as I did um, the first time. You know, and, and basically, I just, when National Lampoon fell in quality, uh, I kept buying it only so I could read the Trots and Bonnie every month. And uh, the only thing about this collection that's kind of a downer is, is that she left some strips out. It's not a complete collection, and it could easily have been with the addition of maybe 10 more pages. It could have been a complete Trots and Bonnie, but it is not. And her reasoning was is that looking back on the strips, she didn't like how they offended certain segments of society and I thought well wasn't that the whole point of Trots and Bonnie so unfortunately Ms. Flanagan has surrendered to revisionist uh, political correctness ideas so that we can't see unless you go back and buy back issues we can't see the complete Trots and Bonnie in one place which which is a shame because I really think it's a historical record it was a, it was an important strip at the time and, and deserves to be rediscovered by new readers. But as I said, not for the faint of heart. She's, she doesn't skirt the issues. She gets right in there, and it is incredibly frank strip, but always funny, even as she's shocking you. Another book I read was by Len Levinson. This is published by um, Rough Edges Press, which is my publisher for Levon Cade. I didn't realize that. Uh, when I bought the book... <laughs> 
until Len Levinson started talking about his current editor, who's my editor. And I thought, well, wait a minute, this is from my publisher. I could have gotten a free copy, but I wouldn't. I would never have asked for a free copy because I want Len to get the, uh, the, the pittance and royalties uh, from uh, buying this book. Anyway, you don't know who Len Levinson is. And you never would, because Len Levinson wrote a lot of paperback originals in the 60s and 70s, and never put his own name on any of them. And they were always, um, always worth reading. He wrote under many different names. Uh, he wrote what should have been sleaze and trash, but the guy is so talented that these things are so readable. I, I, I was recently in contact with him, and I told him that reading your stuff, it's like a bag of salted peanuts. I mean, you can't stop till you get to the bottom. You can't help yourself. So he wrote all kinds of stuff. And in, in this autobiography, in the trenches, he talks about his time as a paperback writer, writing a novel every six weeks, uh, and basically living hand to mouth, living book to book in uh, Hell's Kitchen in New York, because they, these books didn't pay a lot. And he never got into the, the area where uh, he was making a lot of royalties. So he was a journeyman writer and just cranking stuff out. He has a novel that he wrote in five days because the original writer got sick. And uh, he cautions you never to read it, but he said he wrote it in five days. And he talks about, you know, going and having editors pitch ideas to him. Uh, writing in different genres, writing in different names. He, he, he wrote, a, a, his best-selling book was written under the name of a, of a female. Uh, they, they wanted a, uh, a Valley of the Dolls kind of knockoff, and he wrote it, you know. Uh, Shark Fighter, which I just finished reading, is a ball buster of a book. It is a great book, and it's basically written as a Jaws knockoff. Uh, but because Levinson uh, had quite a bit of experience as a, as a diver, uh, it all comes off, of, he writes with true authority. He writes with true authority on everything that he writes about. And he had several series uh, from Westerns and War and stuff like that. And uh, I dug them all. The guy's just uh, a writer's writer, uh, muscular writing, uh, fast reads. He can just keep that story moving in a clip. My favorite series of him is The Rat Bastards. <laughs> a 16 book series about a ragtag bunch of Marines in the uh, Pacific, fighting the Japanese in World War II. And these things have all the war, war movie tropes and all of the, the characters, you know, you got the guy from Brooklyn, you got the country boy, you got, you know, all this, but, but they're, again, written with authority. Um, Levinson, uh, in, in his autobiography, talks about how he would spend a month researching each one of these books. If he had to write a book about submarines, he spent a month researching that. If he wrote a book about sharks, he spent a month researching sharks. He, he would literally be at the New York Public Library from the time they opened till the time they closed for a month, every day. And Rat Bastards shows it uh, because it's, it's well-researched, it's believable, uh, it's just real good stuff if you can find it. I, I believe they've reprinted all of them. You can probably get them in ebook as well, uh, but they're worth checking out. Uh, and again, I, I just read one after the other after the other until I was done the series, I, I, which is something I don't normally do. But I got so involved with the characters, they seem so believable. And um, anyway, Len Levinson, you should know the name. Hey, if you want to contact me with suggestions, pictures of your dog, hey, pictures of your cat, whatever. You know, just no pictures of the kids. That's creepy. Um, I'll put them up here and say hello to your pet. Tell your pet, you know, you're a good girl, you're a good boy. Whatever they need to hear. They need to hear it, your pets. They need to know. They need that support. Even cats who pretend not to give a crap. They, they need it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, brunobookstore at gmail.com is where you want to reach me. Uh, it's the most reliable way of reaching me at brunobookstore at gmail.com. Repeating it for those of you who only listen to these. And... Um, you know, I check it a bunch of times a day, and that is the place to go. I got a new Levon novel out, Levon's Prey. It's the 10th in the series, and you can get that on Amazon. Levon finally gets to the heart of the child trafficking ring that he has been uh, stalking in the two previous books, but he gets, he gets to the big man, and it gets bloody. 
Levon takes care of business. He cleans the house. He takes out the trash in this novel. And uh, I think you will dig it if you love the vigilante justice thriller. As my publisher says, if you like Jack Reacher, you'll love Levon's Prey. All right, that's it for me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. If you did any uh, kind of cash exchange here, super thank yous, uh, you know, you, you get a super, you're welcome from me. And um, I'll see all of you, hopefully, down the road.